Welcome to Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. I am your host, Lori McGraw. I have spent the past 30 years in leadership, and over the years, I've come to learn one thing. Women need women, and not just any women, but inspiring women. Tune in every week to hear from women at the pinnacle of their careers and from others who are just starting out. Episodes can be found at inspiringwomen.show or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will be inspired. Welcome to this episode of Inspiring Women, and I am so pleased today that we are speaking with Janet DeLeon, and she is the CEO of Connect America, which is a company that she has started a year plus ago. So during the pandemic, it focuses on health monitoring solutions for population management areas. Now, Janet is a proven CEO. She's led many different high-tech companies, both the startups, but also large-scale global enterprises. We're talking about enterprises like Siemens, Nuance, Bernoulli. She is um, really a champion of innovation and that intersection of technology to solve long-standing problems in the delivery of care is where Janet has really found her niche and built some pretty compelling and strong businesses. She is an accomplished author, leader, speaker. She also um, serves on a number of different boards and well-recognized modern healthcare, top 25 women in healthcare, Becker's top 100 women in healthcare, um, most powerful women of the channel award. And Jana, I am really pleased to be speaking with you today. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you so much for the very gracious invitation. And I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation. Great. Well, why don't we start? We always start on inspiring women with, you know, what are you doing now? So what does the day-to-day look like? What does the CEO of Connect America mean? What's day-to-day for you? As you mentioned, I joined Connect America almost a year ago to the day and, you know, came to a company that I thought would be, uh, would be a great change. I spent the bulk of my career in the provider space. So think large health systems and those types of things. And had the opportunity to come to a company that had really been a B2C, a consumer business, but had um, 350,000 home-based customers, which I found fascinating. Like I said, wow, you've solved the last mile. That's incredibly hard and thought it would be a great opportunity. And I joined. And since then, we've done several acquisitions. So, you know, my my goal here is to help to bring out a, a platform that allows us to surround folks in their home, vulnerable populations. It can be the elderly, the chronically ill to surround them with services and and products that can help them stay in that home safely and independently and as graciously as possible. So it's a extraordinarily compelling vision. It's been uh, fascinating thus far, and I know it's going to continue to be so. Congratulations on a year, being there for one year, to, you know, making a switch in direction, if you will, with all your experience to a company in the pandemic. Why that shift um, during pandemic time? What what compelled you? Um, I was very uh, interested in looking at healthcare from a different, through a different lens. And I think in healthcare, you know, it's for those of us that stay in it. it number one, again, it's it's a mission, but you know, we have endless opportunities to quote unquote, leave it better than we found it. And, you know, with the pandemic, it just the orientation of the folks at home um, of what was happening in senior living. And I just thought, what a great opportunity to try to contribute to something that was going, that was happening during the pandemic that, but that was obviously going to be with us after the pandemic. Everyone understands the denominator here globally about the aging population, the U.S., the rest of the world, and all of us are going to be in that population at some point. So I just uh, thought it would be, it, it would, again, a fascinating opportunity to try to bring some solutions to, the, to something I hadn't done before, and I do enjoy doing that. Well, you also have so much experience um, in this space. And so maybe if we can even go back a step to some of your career progression, I mean, you have amazing education, you know, Brown, Wharton. So you're, you know, you're starting off with this base of education, but it seems like you quickly move in your career to very senior leadership positions, pretty brand name um, types of companies, Siemens, Nuance, Bernoulli. So how did that happen? You've been, you've been in healthcare IT and clearly recognized as a leader for some time, but I would say at least, uh, you know, as I look at your um, background, there was a very quick progression to the C-suite. So can you just give some perspective on that? 
Well, as you can expect, anybody that's successful, obviously, I you know was supported by others. So as I look back, I frequently laugh that I just cannot believe the, the opportunities and the quote unquote jobs people gave me. <laughs> just it's extraordinary at a young age. Um, but I was fortunate in the company I started with, Shared Medical Systems, had very mature management, um, very open management. And as I said, people ask now about being a woman. I said, in that era of IT and healthcare, they didn't notice if you were purple or green. Could you understand it? <laughs> you know, could you understand it? Could, do you get it? You know, can you do this? Can you action it? And then, so just had um, phenomenal opportunities. And I, you know, I don't know that I would say I was fearless, but I was probably too naive to understand that I had absolutely should never have agreed to do some of the things. You know, and as I, I tell people now, when I talk to women, I, you know, the other thing I, I, I purposely chose to stay on the product and the P and L side of companies. And I think that was also um, something that helped me along. I, um, I, you know, that was unusual in that era. You know, people usually tracked in different directions and I just stayed on that more left brain side of the business and had some phenomenal opportunities because of it. So I was always at that edge where things were changing, that innovation and that you know, kept me motivated, but also gave me crazy opportunities. And then how did you know, like what, what made you gravitate to that? Was that sort of, so one of the things that I notice is that it strikes me that younger women today, they're at least in my experience, they're very thoughtful about their career progression. And so what, the way you're talking about it is it, it, it sounds like the opportunities just emerged and you grabbed them and, and leaned into them, or were you thoughtful about a career progression that, you know, moved obviously into leadership, which is where you are? I was, and I share this a lot with folks, including my daughters, right? In my view, a career is not linear. It is not a straight line. Those that do well, bounce well. They adapt, they pivot. They say, okay, I'm not going over that wall the way I thought I was. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go around the wall. I'm going to go under the wall. Um, and I think those are the people that do well. And I, I don't know, I, you know, I think personality wise, I just um, had that and just give that advice again, when I, when I speak to others again, and don't be so frustrated when it's not linear and it's not a straight line and something didn't happen in 18 months or 24 months. Are you learning? Are you growing? Are you in, are you, you, you know, you're seeing something new in the market? Are you interested? Take the bounce, adapt. So give us an example, those early formative stages where you pivoted, bounced, adapted, you know, took a different um, place then. Because I mean, women like you at the stage of leadership that you are at, um, you, it, it wasn't a straight line. You hit a lot of um, roadblocks along the way, but yet you found a way to persevere and make something out of them. So I'm just interested if you could share some of the maybe stories of like, you know, where you really like found that, you know, found that way to get around something that otherwise might have, you might've seen block other people. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was young. I would, you know, I was not a vice president or that level yet. I was a senior manager of some sort, and there was there was a reorg going on, and there was absolutely a role that I wanted, and I did not get it. I got an adjacent one, and I just I really wanted the other domain, and I was irritated. And I can still remember who got that job, <laughs> <laughs> and I will not say the name, but I absolutely remember who it was. And I said, okay, and I got this other thing which I really did not want, and I did, and I did not know much about, it. and I thought, okay. All right, let's figure this out. But the good news is it had it was a domain that was profitable. It was revenue generating. It had scale. So those are good things. It had it had a good team, but it needed a pivot. And the pivot was going to be uh, um, to get out of what we were doing organically and to go do a partnership. So I had a phenomenal opportunity to get into the market and wound up negotiating a company who I won't name, but you know was a uh, became the, their stock split three times while we were doing the negotiation. I was in my oh, I remember wow. leaving my daughter's fifth birthday party to go execute a term sheet while we were doing this negotiation. And I spent you know, time up in Silicon Valley before it became Silicon Valley, wound up being on the front edge of cloud-based uh, kinds of solutions. And the company, went, the company became a multi-billion dollar company and it was acquired by Oracle at one point. But I learned so much about negotiating an agreement. And I got to work with the top tier of the company because it was going to be one of the largest partnerships we had ever done. And it was like going to law school. It was a phenomenal opportunity. I learned, ter learned term sheets. I learned the fact that if you can't say no, you can't really negotiate. I learned the fact that make sure you draft and write down all of your assumptions 
so that you can stay constant during the negotiations. But it wound up being a great opportunity, a real contributor to my career. And like I said, when I got it, I could, I probably had effigy dolls of the person that had the, got the job I wanted. <laughs> you know? But what a year or two later, I was like, oh my God, that other job, that was terrible. This was a blast. <laughs> Just that sounds like an amazing opportunity being th sort of like thrown into the deep end, but then, you know, swimming and taking advantage of it. How did, just, how did that then lead to perhaps the next opportunity and the next opportunity? Actually, that job, the, by the time that was arriving at its destination, about 18 months later, at that point, the company was growing. There was a big reorg going on. They were getting to announce a new organization and they were going to announce the first three female vice presidents. And I was fortunate to be one of them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Story. That must have felt fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So also another thing, and again, just, you know, reading, reading the um, reports and as we, you know, look at women in career progressions in healthcare tech, as well as many other industries, women who are rising and a certain point in time, you were rising in your career versus where you were now, but then tend to get stuck. Has that ever happened to you? If so, how did you get out of it? Or have you seen others do it? And why do you think that happens? I'll give you a couple of different answers. In terms of why some people get stuck, my observation is, and this is true again, that goes back to your earlier question about linear. Um, you know, it, a ladder isn't just the vertical, you know, braces, so to speak. The rungs of the ladder are horizontal. And what I notice about a lot of people is they're so career tracked and so progression minded, they forget that they are part of a team. The people with whom they work their teammates, the horizontal network matters just as much, if not more than the vertical network. Um, and my observation is a lot of people forget that. Um, and they, you know, they just don't, they're not the best teammate. And when it comes time for people to promote and to get those really big jobs, the leadership is going to look for those, you know, who have, who are viewed and, you know, strongly supported by that important peer network. And I think it's a, it's a, it's something that I, and I go out of my way to point it out. And I think sometimes, especially women are so singularly focused on the forward and the vertical that they lose the horizontal. And I think that, uh, you know, we kind of have to keep pushing that and learning it. And I think a lot of that was done in other eras by others on golf courses and in after dinner drinks. And, you know, if that's not part of the culture. It has to be done at work and you have to be a fantastic teammate. So how do you think people need to do it today? Because, you know, another thing that I, you know, spend time talking to younger women about is how they are navigating just building their career progression process or progress, you know, in a pandemic where we're not quite out of it. We're not all back in the office um, yet. You and I are both in offices today. But um, what, what are you suggesting to people, particularly, again, women who have taken more the brunt of the, I will just say, uh, career progression toll during this pandemic time? Well, again, if, you, if you're just speaking to going forward, I think, again, you have to demonstrate that there are times where what you are working on is not the number one priority. Um, you, need, you really need to find your way to contribute to what is the number one priority. So, you know, usually you have a talent, you, you kind of know what your differentiating talent is, and you need to bring it to bear on that, which is the corporate priority, run to the fire. Um, and just because you may not be quote unquote owning that initiative or leading it, um, others will see and watch that contribution you're making. I think that that's a, a really important thing to do, whether you're virtual or in person. And again, I, I, I try to point this out often to not only women, you know, but others with whom I work is that go to the fire, go to the important thing. And just because you're not leading, it does not mean you cannot contribute to it. And that's, if this is not a time to be timid. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story associated with that. So another time I, um, we were changing CEOs and I was, you know, I was, I don't know, some rank in the management team and the new CEO came in. It was a very challenging, toxic environment. And he was bringing people into interview the first couple of days. And I walked in and I had a list and I literally, it was literally labeled the top five things I would do if I were you. And I, I you know, as I had been around, I was somewhat senior. I knew the culture and fast forward a year I got a big promotion to a, to a C-suite role. And he said, you know, it was that day that you walked in with a list of what to do 
as opposed to telling me everything that was wrong. That's when I started to pay attention to who you were. <laughs> well, also the, you know, the contributing to the solutions and it is, it is a big deal. And I think that, you know, this is an opportunity, you know, particularly for women. And I think a lot about you, you know, the younger women who are following in your footsteps in as much as you can participate in the solution, people do think of you differently. They think of you as a problem solver, um, even though you are trying to focus on another problem, but, you know, complaining is often not usually helpful <laughs> in terms of what that means for folks. You know, Janet, at some point, I don't know if it was a, your first large response job responsibility or the neck or the second or the third or the fourth one. But at some point you moved from just C-suite executive to also taking on board responsibilities. When did that start to happen? Why, and why was that an important thing for you to do? It, it's funny, right? As you, you know, the, the network begets the network. And I think that's always going to be a theme when we talk about women um, and diversity, which, you know, we probably will hear is that and what I found most, especially with boards, was that boards tend to look like themselves. And then when you get inside the board, you realize why. And it's like, oh, because the boards usually get filled by people's networks, which again goes back to the need for diversity. So I was always intrigued to be on a board. I was fortunate in that I was asked to join a board by one of the investors in one of the companies I was leading. Um, and that became uh, my first board experience. So again, it fulfills, you know, that, that, that notion of the network is important. Um, and it's, it's been great. It's, it's a public company. I, I've learned a lot. But again, it's, it is the network. Yep. Yep. And that's also a really important thing, obviously, for women. Janet, in your career, you're doing something really different. You're looking at a different um, sort of angle of the healthcare equation. What, what do you do at, at this place of leadership to stay sharp, to stay current, to stay energized about the work that you're doing? I think that leaders who typically sustain and have, you know, continuous success are themselves endlessly curious. It sounds so trite, but, you know, people who just read relentlessly and are just lifelong learners. And I think you notice this in people over the years. Are you a lifelong learner? You know, do, do you do you consciously go seek new information? So I think that is, you know, something that has sustained me. So I, I just enjoy what I call phase zero, where I don't know anything and I get to, just get to ask experts an extraordinary number of questions. So I just think that's like fantastic. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's going to school and that's what energizes me. And then in return for that favor and for that courtesy of them sharing their knowledge with me, then I say, okay, I see, I see a way. I see a pivot. I see we're here today. And I see we're going to go over here. This is the direction. This is the where. So my job is to see where and then to show how. So it's not just enough to state that I see a digital platform or I see an opportunity. Then you have to be able to articulate, we're going to take these series of steps. We're going to do it in this logical progression. And here's how we're going to go from a company of today to the company of tomorrow. And, and just bringing it to, you know, your business and, and your healthcare experience. I mean, healthcare, of course, during the, you know, it has been getting bigger, accelerating, you know, and yet some of the problems uh, remain and loom large. What are you optimistic about in the future of healthcare and this intersection um, with technology? Or what are you perhaps more skeptical about? You said that you wanted to leave it better than where you found it. So what are your thoughts about that? I am uh, extraordinarily enthusiastic about the talent that I see coming into healthcare. I get to see healthcare through the lens of pharmaceutical company that I work with. I get to see healthcare through the digital lens. And I just, I think it's great. I think that the, you know, a few years ago, the talent was headed in certain directions. And now I just think you see people with phenomenal backgrounds and educations coming into healthcare because again, they see it as an opportunity to contribute. So that is my number one because it's only going to be solved by those talented people. So absolutely, the talent's fantastic. It's great. It's energizing. I love being surrounded by smart people. <laughs> That, that is that is great. So as, as we think about that, Janet, as we close out here on Inspiring Women, I'd love to just know, you know, quick question, you know, is there anything just along the way, whether it was a book or a particular um, thing that you looked to that was inspiring to you that helped shape sort of your thinking, your leadership style that you might want to tell us about? Um, I, I, I'm going to have to say the answer is it's my mother. My mother was the mother of five. She was a nurse. You know, I watched somebody raise five children and work. 
her entire life and was absolutely an endlessly curious learner, got her MBA while all of us were in high school. So I saw someone do it. I saw someone, I had the good fortune to watch someone balance life and work and raise a family. So I think I had um, a great, great behaviors to, to model and to see that. Yeah, what a great role model. It's always, um, you know, that family environment um, is so inspiring. As we close out, Janet, any last sort of like advice for younger, aspiring um, women who are looking to follow in your kind of footsteps? I mean, I think it's as we've spoken, it's you, you have to really enjoy what you're doing, right? You have to be again, that endlessly curious about it. Um, and if, if you have that, you know, you can do anything. Um, you can simply do anything. And um, I just would, you know, as I said, I counsel my daughters on that. I counsel others, just enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey, enjoy the bounce. <laughs> <laughs> That is great. This has been a great conversation. We'll close out on that. On this Inspiring Women episode, we've been talking with Janet DeLeon. And Janet, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for your time. And thank you for what you're doing. It's fantastic. Thank you. This has been an episode of Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We are produced by Kate Cruz at Executive Podcast Solutions. More episodes can be found on inspiringwomen.show. I am Lori McGraw, and thank you for listening.